This is Ben Woodford here at Modern Education Radio Hour in 90.1 KZSU Stanford. This is a show where we dig into everything from current research trends to far out ideas concerning any topic even remotely related to education. I'm Ben Woodford, your host here in the studio. I'll be with you every Friday from 3 to 4 p.m. for your commute. Here at Modern Education, we bring cutting-edge ideas, philosophical discussions, insights from experts, and just about everything else you want to know. The goal is to help listeners interact with and understand learning in all its forms. If you have questions or suggestions for the show, you can tweet at BenWoodford1 on Twitter. I'll do my best to include your ideas in future shows. If you're a teacher, parent, student, or anyone interested in our collective future, I hope you'll tune in each week as we examine new ideas and interview guests from a variety of backgrounds. Welcome back to Modern Education. I have my guest in the studio today is Dr. Felicia Darling. Dr. Felicia Darling has a PhD in math education from Stanford University. She is a Fulbright scholar, holds a bachelor's in mathematics and a California single subject math credential. Felicia uh, leads professional development for districts, departments, and teachers and has been a teacher in public schools. She's worked with students from various backgrounds, ages, and skill levels and currently teaches at the Santa Rosa a junior college. She also, also runs a professional development consulting company called Activate Math. I'm going to bring Felicia on the mic here and we're going to have our discussion for today. Felicia, welcome to the studio. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Oh, I, I was, can't be as excited as I am. This has been a real joy to prepare for. I've been in, excited and interested in all the stuff you have going on. Wow, you prepared. I didn't know. Uh, I always <laughs> prepare. <yeah>. Awesome. <laughs> like a Boy Scout, right? They're ready for for anything. You're a pro. <laughs> so I, I like to start by just giving the audience an idea of your background, like especially if you have maybe a story that can help us understand how you got into education and how you became such a, a dedicated advocate for students. Oh, thanks. Uh, well, you know, I come from a poverty background. My, I always start with my daughter was born in a house without plumbing, electricity in, in rural Vermont. So I had a lot of experience living in poverty and, and know how hard that is and how hard it is for students to overcome poverty. I guess research just came out. It takes 20 years for students to overcome poverty. And that's if almost nothing goes wrong. I, for me, it probably took 30 years, but I did it because um, things do go wrong. But anyway, so I started with that kind of angle and I really believe in helping students who are first generation college students in particular or students who are experiencing exceptional learning challenges or minority students who might be exposed to systemic uh, inequities to help them to achieve and so that's kind of was my my inroad and I taught in community colleges part time and I lived in poverty actually over in Vermont till I moved to California and I started focusing on English learners here and got trained in this really great programs the bits of programs in schools here in California to support uh, language learners. And then I went started at Stanford in 2010 and mm-hmm. where I really get to focus and really hone some of those skills and get really dig into the research and, and take advantage of some of the resources in graduate school to make me s- such a better instructor of uh, students who are first generation college students, students who are coming back to college, student, and I, I only teach math. And I also support teachers who mm-hmm. are, you know, trying again to work in public schools, as you probably know, in public schools is more a higher concentration of low income students than there's ever been. I think it's a majority now. And so that's really important for teachers to have kind of be leaning into students who yeah. could go to college, but maybe there's like a cultural incongruence. As you probably already know, 83% of all teachers in school are white, middle class and female. So there is a, a potential for a lot of cultural incongruence. So that's, that's kind of my interest area, my passion. Wow. Wow. That's such a great story. And I, what I'm, I'm thinking about as you're, as you're telling this story is I, I'm really curious about how things have changed from before you started getting this kind of higher level knowledge mm-hmm. to after as far as your approach to supporting students and helping them to overcome some of the systemic challenges that they face. Right, I promised I wouldn't go on and on about Stanford, but yeah. I was exposed to so much here. Uh, I was exposed to growth mindset research, uh, Claude Steele's stereotypes type threat research and uh, Rachel Lotan's 
complex instruction as well as Joe's, of course, model uh, her. I, I consider it really egalitarian approach to teaching students. And that really opened up my world and opened up my bag of tricks, you know, my tools to really support student success, particularly among first generation college students. Because yeah. at my current job, which I absolutely love, I call it my forever job. I work with students um, first semester, of course, uh, the researcher in me, I said, come on and you get extra credit. Tell me your story. And I heard stories, people who had been uh, in, in and out of jail with felony convictions for crystal meth addiction, 19 year olds who lost their whole family due to fentanyl addiction, mm -hmm. students who were in Thai refugee camps. These students are so motivated and they're back at school. First, I, I teach the first math class, sometimes the very first class they have when they yeah. come back to college after having kind of a history of some real challenges. So I love that I can draw from the research that I was exposed to here at Stanford and kind of instantiate that research into instruction and try things in the classroom. And, and it's, I would say it's really working. I see students, uh, 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 uh I see students mi having mindset shifts, not just growth mindset shifts, but but shifts uh, around their identity as a competent math learner mm, and yeah. as a college student and as a mathematician. And I'm really happy to be part of that. And I would say that the most recent influence is, besides my own personal experience in teaching, I've, the only experience I've ever had really in teaching is teaching first generation college students mm. or teaching in schools with 75% students who are from poverty backgrounds or English learners. So I've had a lot of practice working with students like that, but now I just bring so many more tools to bear on it. Yeah. So if I'm, I'm trying to sort of distill the essence of what you're saying and what it sounds like to me is the knowledge that you've gained has become the power that you wield in the world to be able to help make things a better place. And that expansion of your repertoire and your understandings and your exposure to a lot of these different thought processes has given you a whole new set of tools. Does that sound pretty accurate? Or? I think the knowledge and also the passion. So, I've, yeah. so I have a PhD from Stanford in math ed, right? Promised I wouldn't keep bringing it up here. Uh -huh. I keep bringing it up again. But anyway, and so I find myself at a community college. Well, I could have gone and done something else, but that's where I belong is with those students. I have an affinity for those students. So it's not just the knowledge. It's also, maybe it's a calling. Okay. I see myself yeah. in the students. I see my family members who none of them have graduated from college so still. Yeah. And some of them, about half my family is still on food stamps, went to prison. And so I see, I see like redemption in a way, because I see my own family in the, in the lives of these students. And they're so motivated. They're very scared that first day in their first college class, but they're really, really motivated. And I'm so glad I'm the one there to help them on that journey. You know, there's oh, yeah. other great teachers in my department. Believe yeah. me, I'm in the college skills department, but I feel good that, that I'm there. So it's, it's the knowledge. And then also I just have that passion. That's this, this is, these are the students I really want to work with. I kind of love them. I'm that maybe sounds yeah. stupid and corny, Not but to me at all. I kind of love them. Yeah. And I don't think love solves everything. I actually no. instantiate this research into practice practice and I think that really helps to elevate their again their identities as college learners as competent math learners as mathematicians yeah yeah and that's such an important thing that you speak of love and it's not you know our society I think a lot of times thinks of love as something that has to be romantic mm -hmm. and love is what keeps parents getting up in the middle of the night to tend to their babies and what gets teachers up in the morning to care for their students and love can take on a lot of different forms and it can be a powerful motivator when we see people that we care about. That's a powerful reason to get up and keep doing the hard work, even when it seems sometimes like there's no light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. And, and honestly, I know it's, again, people say this, if you find a job you love, you'll never work a day in your life. But I don't mind it. I work all the time. What else can I do? Can I meet with these students? You know, I walk students over to mental health services. Our, half the town burned down up there in Santa Rosa. You know, mm -hmm. and we had to give extra support. And I, I really enjoy doing that. Like you said about getting up at night because your baby's crying, even though you're like, wow, I haven't slept for three days. Right. I really love working with these students. And they never disappoint you. They You just watch them and they excel because they're super motivated. And despite all those challenges, they show up for class and 
despite being so terrified, some of them, because my God, no one in my family went to college. Oh my God, I'm from prison. They just show up and they do the hard work, even right. though they're afraid they can't do it. So it's really, it's really easy to be along the journey with them and try to do all the right things that you can do to, to support that and, and help them to develop that identity as competent learners, competent math learners. Right. And they deserve it too. Somebody's got to take a chance on them and give them the chance, right? Yeah. And it's this, my job's not for everybody. I work in a college skills department with other college skills instructors. Right. I think we'd all say we love the job and, and we, it's a calling. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And it's lucky that we have people that are taking on that calling because we need it so badly. Yeah. There's a lot of people that need that chance to be able to get a new uh, new start on life, whatever that takes them. That's not our call. Right. And I actually did go to Santa Rosa Junior College, so I have yeah, a, a special right. affinity because I started at the very bottom of math there. No way. And worked my way up slowly. So when you're telling this story, it's like pulling on my heartstrings uh-huh. and really reminding me of what a wonderful school that was and how much help and support I got along the way to help me get where I'm at now. It's so. rated the second best uh, community college in all of California and uh, one of the the top five colleges to teach at in the whole country. Wow. Plug for SRJC. There you go, yeah. <laughs> I will always plug SRJC. It's my forever job. Yeah. <laughs> so I wanted to just sort of lay out what you think are some of the main struggles students are facing in education and in institutional types of education. Yeah. So one of the things that bothers me about the research is this idea of this deficit approach. My research is not does not take a deficit approach mm-hmm. around uh, students who come from low resource communities. Uh, you know, a lot of research is like, oh, kids kids who are poor come to school with fewer words. Kids who are poor come to school with brain issues. I forgot what the question was. No, yeah, <laughs> totally. Uh, so just trying to lay out what are some of the main struggles students yeah. are facing that so, are trying to get through institutional yeah. education. So, Oh, yeah. Now I know yeah. where I was going. So one thing I'd like to say that students who are poor need money. So right. so so that is a big issue. They are poor. I had a girl last year. We had the fires. She was an African-American girl doing really well. And then we had the fires up there. We lost 6,500 buildings and she didn't come back to class. So I yeah. had to I had to track her down. Her phone didn't work, whatever, whatever. Finally found her and she was sleeping in her car and she had really been homeless before. So that's yeah. a real challenge. I had to really like like work with her to connect her with resources, which the JC is very good at. But so that those are re, they have real challenges like that. They have real challenges like not going back on to crystal meth when I mean these students in particular have, mm-hmm. have real like physical challenges, poverty challenges. In the classroom, however, I would say uh, I focus on helping shifting uh, fostering a growth mindset classroom mm-hmm. so strictly okay. you know apart from their problems outside of class which is I'm sure very hard for them to separate some yeah. of them are working full time they have socioeconomic challenges like that uh, some of them have babies mm-hmm. um uh, but in the classroom, what I try to do is create, foster a growth mindset classroom where they're they're safe to take risks. They're safe to make mistakes. Um, I use Joe's approach and complex instruction. I try to encourage them to, uh, you know, I try to elicit their unique approaches so they're 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 unique approaches are valued in the classroom. So yeah. in the classroom, I think what they need is a different model of instruction, which, and that's what I'm trying to provide because obviously if they're 35 and in a classroom where we're teaching fractions, the old model that they've been through didn't work. Right. If they're 19 and just graduated from high school and they've been placed in a class where we're um, doing long division with or without decimals, then what they've done before doesn't work. So I think uh pedagogically what they need is something different. And so I try to create a growth mindset classroom uh, and I try to create opportunities for them to communicate their unique approaches to problem solving instead of being, again, the authority and going, this is how you do it. Everybody copy me because that's what they already did and it didn't work for them. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm just trying to recap here. You, You talked about the resources outside of school, which is so important because it's really hard to focus on your studies when you need food and a place to sleep at night. And then the other piece is giving a different type of experience, that uh, a growth-minded experience, a, a, a responsive to student needs type of experience that gives them something different than what every teacher's been trying to force on them for all the years that never worked. And if it, it hasn't 
work this yeah. long. Yeah. It makes perfect sense that we shouldn't just keep doing it and blame them. It's clearly the teacher's responsibility to take a new approach at some point, right? Yeah, and I would say everyone in our department has that point of view where they take, they, they get it, they're going to try something new with students. Yeah, yeah. But, but I also think I do, uh, I know I mentioned that um, I like the idea of disrupting systemic equity uh, inequities in mm-hmm. at the classroom level. Yeah. I have to say that I... I, I do some of that work too, and I think that's important. Some of the, some of the stereotype threat work, uh, some of the affirmation kind of work of Claude Steele and Cohen and Walton. Can, can we break down a few of these things for yeah. the listeners? I'm not sure everyone will, will get what these topics are, the responsive teaching, can, or just yeah. pick one and yeah. break it down a little yeah, bit Yeah, let me us. see. So, well, complex instruction, mm-hmm. perhaps people know about Cohen and, Loten and uh, Lotan, and that's the idea of we're doing this group instruction, like both or does low floor, high ceiling tasks, mm-hmm. a lot of conversations. And one element of that is affirming status of low status students in groups. So I do group work every single day, randomly assigned groups. Mm-hmm. And so let me give you a story. There was a student, Anahi, one day. We were doing work in groups, and I noticed that the other students, this is an example of affirming status in groups. The other yeah. students weren't really picking up on her ideas. Mm-hmm. And so I went over and I was like, so Anahi, what's your approach, right? Trying to give a little, illuminate some of her own assets and her approaches to the other students students there and she told me her approach was to subtracting negative numbers and it was actually an approach I'd never seen before and so I went up to the board and I said Anaya do you mind sharing this with the class and so she told us her approach and I made sense out of it and and made the point that this is a super innovative approach I'd never seen it before what an interesting way to explain this you know kind of elevating her status in the class in the group because I noticed the group wasn't picking up on it and what was remarkable is that on the next quiz two students actually used her approach and approach I'd never seen in my life. Wow. And so to me, that's an example of uh, uh, Lotan and uh, Cohen's complex instruction where they affirm the status of students in groups. So that's one example yeah. of something. There's also Claude Steele's wi- three-tiered wise feedback. There's also normalizing. Um, well, let's slow down. Let's break okay. that one down. Okay. So Claude Steele's three-tier, what's it called? Uh, three-tiered wise feedback. Okay. So in that case, uh, when you give feedback, they did a big study and they found that when they gave, there was three parts of it, right? critical feedback, communicating high expectations for all students and communicating I believe in you. Mm -hmm. And they found out, particularly with minority students, if they just said, I believe in you, you can do it, you know, minority students, it was demotivating because it seemed like a big lie. Yeah, yeah. I guess that's that's not very researchy for me to say, but that's how, (laughs) that's my take on it. If you just give critical feedback and said, I believe in you, eh, you know, it's still, it was demotivating. But if they put that extra critical feedback, I believe in you and I have really high standards for right. your performance, it really does motivate students. And so I do that, even though a lot of students will try to get you to give that com- comfort-oriented praise, which mm-hmm. research shows is demotivating. Um, I don't. Like that learned helplessness kind of thing that people talk about, or just to try to get you to be a little too comfort-oriented. I'm like, no, this is my standard. Yeah. I know you can do it. Here's some help to help you do that, and I believe in you. So it's a little bit of tough love and a little bit of love-love, I guess. Yeah. And so, yeah. so that's Claude Steele three-tiered wise feedback. Okay. So, so I use these things because I saw Greg Walton present once and he was tr- he was he was trying to get people to here's the research, see how you could use it in your mm-hmm. in your work. And so I started using it in my work and I think it's working. So right, so it's right. you know basically taking I mean they do the research, they find this result from the intervention. Same thing with growth mindset, right? They find that this intervention works with students, so they're like, hey, go try it in your classes. Right, right. Yeah. And that's the big push, I think, in education is this research-based practices. Right, right. And taking the research that's been done elsewhere and mm-hmm. putting it into practice and being able to show how we can do this in our classrooms with real students without these contrived sort of experimental conditions to right. try to yeah, show something helpful. can work. We, if yeah. we know it works, now it's time to get it in the classroom and see what we can do with it. And that yeah. sounds like exactly what you're doing. So. Is, oh, can I tell you one more? Uh, yeah, a, please do. Uh, yeah. so we there's want another all the free one. trips, ticks for uh, okay. teachers as possible. Um, what, so Greg Walton would be proud of me, I'm sure. Uh, um, the other one is, um, it's called a 
affirming value. I'm trying to look at my notes to see who did that because yeah. you, know, you want to give credit to people. But anyway, somebody did a study. Uh-huh. <laughs> they have Google. They'll figure it out. <laughs> um, and what they did is with seventh grade boys, it was seventh grade students. Uh-huh. And what they did is they let students affirm their values. They actually let them write a 20 minute essay on what are their core values, right? Oh, wow. And they found that for African American males in particular, their performance in all their classes improved for like two, three years down the road. Oh my God. You know, right? Because, yeah. you know, and I, I'm not sure why that all happened, but if you can think about it, you know, so finally in a educational setting, you're actually touching base with your own core values, right? Right. And so it's actually, I do that in my classes. I did it when I taught uh, education class at San Jose State. I do it with my classes and I help them to tap into what are your core values? And we actually, in a math class, talk about that. Yeah. So it's a time in a professional setting where they, they get grounded in their core values. And I, and I actually think I incorporate it into this activity I do, which I think is a really great activity where I have them draw a picture uh-huh. of something they're good at that they get better at over time. Oh, yeah. And I say, this is where you have a growth mindset. So everybody draws the picture and people draw soccer and baking and cooking. And so in, in some ways they're affirming their values, but we're also doing a growth mindset activity too. So they draw this picture that they're good at, they got better at over time. And I say, this is where you have a growth mindset because many students in my class do not have a growth mindset specifically around math. Right. And so then then we debrief. I go, what, what do you do when it gets challenging? And they talk about that. What do you do when you make a mistake? I go, when you make a mistake and it's soccer, do you kick it into the goalposts? You go, oh my God, I didn't get it in. Drop the mic, leave and go, soccer's not for me. No, we don't do that. <laughs> right. And so, so just to impress upon them, well, what do you do? And then like, so what do you do? So what do you do if to get better at it? And they talk about seeking out mentors, taking a break. And I go, can you use that in math? And so we use that as a springboard to talk about skill improvement in math because so many people in there think they're not good at college. No one in their family is they're not good at math that's why they're in my class and so this is like the springboard we use to to help them make that shift and it also touches bases based with one of their core values so i think i'm doing two things the stereotype threat intervention here and a growth mindset one and what's interesting is you know Three months later, I was working with a student and I said to him, oh, he came into my class, he said he wanted to work with me on anxiety because I do a lot with neuroscience and anxiety mm-hmm. in class. Mm-hmm. And um, I said, well, what did you draw for your picture? And I said, what did you what did you pick for your, your thing that you have a growth mindset you get better at over time? He goes, I don't know. I go, well, what picture did you draw? And that picture was like an experience, like a lived experience. Right. And then he remembered and it kind of brought him back to that moment. And I, I think that's a really strong activity. In fact, I did that with a school for, for, on one of Joe's projects and where they showed shifts in mindset. So, I mean, I can't say for sure that's what did it. Right. But, but I think that's a pretty solid activity for doing for really emphasizing growth mindset and also getting them to affirm their values because they pick something they love, of course. Right, They're not going right. to pick something they hate. Yeah, so I want to unpack that a little mm-hmm. bit for a second. I'm, what I'm hearing is you... you uh, incorporate the, this visual aspect where they need to take something that's meaningful to them and make it visual mm-hmm. that allows them to make, maybe make a different something type of connection. Something they got better at over time. Right. So it's definitely an area, and I, always, I frame it that we go, this is an area where you have a growth mindset. Right, and that's an important piece also. Mm-hmm. The the growth mindset can easily be mistaken as something you have or you don't have. Right, yeah. yeah. And it ends this, up getting the, fixed. Yeah, and this piece that you're, you're talking about is pointing out that we are all growth minded about something. Something, we yeah. All believe that we can improve and have evidence even that we have improved Mm -hmm. in some areas of our lives. Mm -hmm. And so it sounds like what you're doing is bridging that gap between the familiar, Mm -hmm. what they already know they can improve at, Mm -hmm. and the thing that they need to improve at, which is probably in your class in this context. Yeah, and and get them to focus on how they're going to deal with risks and mistakes and challenges and tough times in math. Like, how did you do it in soccer? Did you just give up and drop the mic? I'm out. No, you don't do that. You're like, oh, I'm going to work hard or I'm going to go get the coach or get some help or take a break. They have all these answers. They like solve all the problems for me. And then I write them on the board and they go, could these work in math? And they're like, oh yeah. (laughs) That's so great. You're bringing in the analogy aspect of learning to show them that these, these things happen in all in their lives already. Yeah. And you're making it transparent for them in the classroom so that they can make the conclusion that 
they can do this and they've already done it. It's just haven't done it with math yet. And they could have a growth mindset around developing a growth mindset in math, right? It's something you can develop. Yeah. But I just want one point I do want to make yeah, because uh, I know when I just went to Berkeley, uh, I was presenting there and then sometimes at UC Santa Cruz, I taught a course there and people are really against growth mindset and even some of my friends mm -hmm. and I'm a big proponent and I just want to make sure I make this point. Okay. So, so many times, it, so that's why it's contextual. I'm talking about growth mindset in math learning. Right. So there's this big trend to talk about grit, teach grit, teach grit to poor people, right? I mean, mm -hmm. my students do not need me. I'm not an authority. I, mean, I am not positioned in any position at all to teach them about grit. They showing up. They're there after having really hard lives, harder right. than mine. I'm not going to teach them grit. Right. And and the problem with this grit idea is people sometimes e uh, conflate it with growth mindset. They're like, we got to teach them grit. They have to work harder. They have to know that they can get better and better. As if growth mindset is in every area in every context. I'm really only talking about growth mindset specifically with respect to math learning, not right. specifically with respect to overcoming issues that people might have in life. Same thing with stereotype threat. There's real systemic problems in our society. There's systemic racism. There's poverty. There's systemic classism. There's all kinds of isms. Those are real. And, and no amount of grit is, I, I worry about the grit argument kind of negates that. Right. And one of the things when I teach teachers about growth mindset is the first thing I show them is a slide of telomeres. I mean, I don't know if you know, they call telomeres. I, mm -hmm. I pronounce them telomeres though. Yeah. I guess you can do whatever you want. Anyway, <laughs> so anyway, I show them a slide. I say, this is your DNA. See those little pink buffers on the end? Those right. are telomeres and they're a buffer and they're a marker of aging. Meaning when you're older, they get shorter and right. guess what? You're older. Ah, right. Yeah. Well, they did studies and they found that African-American people, African-American students, and also poor students have shorter telomeres, telomeres, right? That means they have shorter markers of aging. That's wow. not good. Yeah. Furthermore, they found that in families, in, in African-American families or in poor families, the higher achieving sibling actually has shorter t telomeres than the wow. lower achieving sibling, right? Wow. And that is not true in families that are white middle class. That's not true about the two siblings. The high achieving sibling does not have a shorter telomere. And I say that to people. Sometimes they don't get it. And I don't know. I got to get better at it, I guess. <laughs> but I say that to, so that people understand yeah. there are real physical costs to saying to students, we're going to teach you to have grit. They have right. to, uh, African-American students, minority students, uh, poor students have to overcome so many obstacles to be a high achiever that there are real physical costs. I mean, that shouldn't discourage students, but it's a reality. Yeah. They're like, it's like they're doing the same thing other people are doing by carrying, you know, all this weight or something. And, right. and, and, and I'm sure some, uh, the uh, damage to telomeres can be attenuated with certain kinds of therapies and stuff like that. Yeah. But I just like to say that because yeah. I, I don't like when people are like, well, we're going to teach grit. We're going to teach people to have a growth mindset and that's going to overcome. It's not going to overcome systemic racism. It's not going right. to overcome right. poverty. Poor right. students need money and resources and African-American students need to feel safe in the classroom and safe in the U.S. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, you know, it's really tough with these types of cases because we're trying to fix a whole lifetime of struggles and problems as if that needs fixing instead of rec recognizing the strengths that brings to our society and instead of recognizing the power that these people have to be able to show the rest of us how to be resilient and how mm -hmm. to have grit. It's not that they need to be taught how to have grit. They need mm -hmm. to be taught math in your specific case. And yeah. that is helping them open up new doors, which are not connected to their past, but hopefully opening up their futures. I like the way you said that. I feel that way. I feel like we should be illuminating the assets of these students in the classroom. That's why I like Joe Bowler's approach, because it's so egalitarian. She mm -hmm. makes explicit people's unique approaches. That really is shining a light on on their assets. It's not saying I'm the authority, the book's the authority, uh, I'm the instructor, I'm the authority. It says your point of view is important. The way you solve this approach is the best way. And neuroscience supports that, connecting to prior knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, it, it, it deepens conceptual knowledge for students to talk in groups. I mean, research neuroscientists supporting that that's the right approach just from a pedagogically, but from a social justice point of view, it's important for people points of views to be honored and their assets to be illuminate, illuminated in the classroom. It should be a safe place for them to shine. 
Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And the the funny thing is, is we all get better from that by being able to allow different voices to be heard and new perspectives to be brought into the conversation. I mean, I'm thinking of the the research that's been done around having gender balancing in work in in workplaces. You get better results when you have new voices and more people able to chime in. Things work better and things run smoother, and that is a advantage for all of us. So I I, I think that just sort I of like backs that up point what of you're view, saying. Yeah. Yeah. And Joe Power's research showed that in classes, if Joe's listening, I'm sure he's not because he's probably busy doing his dissertation, uh, but in, in in classes where they had the greatest effect in, mm-hmm. in terms of the stereotype threat intervention, so where the stereotype threat intervention had the greatest effect on students who were experiencing stereotype threat, minority students or women in math, yeah. that those classes with the biggest effect, actually the other students had the greatest improvement as well. It's kind of research that's supporting the point that you were saying right that right. like when you when those students are their anxieties alleviated and they're able to be freed up to, to express who they really are that the other other students really are excelling as well it's exactly what you said but it's yeah. but it's like the research of joe power yeah that's yeah. greg walton and um jeff cohen as well okay those okay. guys are all yeah, together I, there. I, I, love, I, I love getting <laughs> these names out here just so that people want to learn more they can go, google it right. look it up try to dig in for themselves and that's really this is always the start point, right? We can't give all the keys to the castle if we had them, and we can't solve all the problems even if we wanted to, but we can start opening up the conversation, and that is always a good place to begin seeking it out for yourself and taking ownership over these things. So keep throwing out those names, absolutely, because <laughs> it gives people uh, pointers and markers to be able to take it on for themselves. Uh, so let's let's move on a little bit here. We've been talking... Oh, can I just uh, say one thing? Uh, that the, please. The self-affirming narrative was Cohen, Garcia, Apfel, and Master. I just okay. wanted to get that right because yeah. I really had it wrong there. Uh, absolutely. Okay. Again, we got a good marker for people. They can uh, <laughs> okay, uh, when, Once I get this up online, people can rewind and get, get all these okay, resources. Great. So I love getting those out there. So what about parents? If a parent is trying to support their child, maybe a parent with a, a student who has been struggling or a student who uh, they know hasn't had all the advantages and they want to be able to give them the best possible outcome, what can parents do to start being more supportive or helpful or give, getting resources for their kids, maybe being a learning broker, if you will? Well, so that's K through 12, right? Uh-huh. Um, so I have worked with some parent last Last year, I... I, I actually work with about a thousand, two thousand teachers, I don't know, in Monterey County and, and a bunch of parent groups as well. And also taught, of course, in middle school. I find that, uh, as you know, parents really want the best for their kids, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we did a couple parent groups on the growth mindset and also on Common Core math. Of course, I only know about Common Core. I only know about math, right? Because that's mm-hmm. my thing. Yeah. Um, so, so what I notice is that parents, especially with the Common Core math, really need some time to get comfortable with that. That right. could really help them because then they could be positioned as someone who could help their students, their 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 children. But also. Really Reading about we, you know, reading about learning about growth mindset is a good thing. But again, it, it gets misapplied sometimes. I would stick with it specifically in math. But sometimes parents don't have a growth mindset in math. They're like, I'm not a math person. You hear that a lot from parents, oh, yeah, yeah. and that can't be helpful as a female parent saying that. And your daughter's like, Yeah, I'm not a math person either. I guess that's an okay thing to say. Right. So that could be changing their language. Carol Dweck has these great, really easy to read. I think Scientific American has a couple articles she wrote that are in, in her videos are great too. They're just really easy and accessible and, and you really start to, just from watching them, you can really, a parent could really change their own language around, you know, math mindset, growth mindset. And Joe yeah. Bowler has you cubed, right? right. There's a million resources for parents and yeah. videos and she even has that, that's what parents should do. They should take they should take that course with their, their uh, child. It's free. Mm-hmm. How to learn math with Joe Bowler. Yeah. There's a lot of great resources that, and they're just like watching TV, right? Right. I mean, I mean, Joe, that's the, Joe with that course. I mean, it was it was amazing the differences in students' grades, their attitudes around math. She did it with teachers. I don't know if she did it with parents, but the parents could watch it with the students. Yeah, and it's easy because it's free, and it's yeah. six. I think it's six, maybe twenty-five minute videos, okay. something like okay, that. Okay, good. So we're throwing out some more resources for yeah. parents and yeah, students. That's, that's awesome. Yeah, and I, I want to see if I can uh, just sort of synthesize what you're saying here. So 
a lot of times parents, it, it sounds like what you're saying, and I've heard this from other people as well, that when parents have sort of a block against math themselves and they have this sort of this identity that they've taken on, that they're not a, a math person. I'm doing air quotes right now mm-hmm. in the studio for the listeners. So when, when someone claims to have this identity, it's really easy for their kids to grab a hold of that too. You know, my dad's a carpenter. I will be a carpenter. My dad, my mom's not a math person or my dad's not a math person. I'm not either. And so how could, there's, there's a language there that could easily be changed, right? You yeah. say, I struggled in math. I had a hard time. There's a lot of things mm-hmm. we could say that's not, oh, I'm just not good at that. Or I wasn't good at math then, but maybe I could be now. I mean, a lot of parents will like come to workshops where they're doing like Joe's activities. I'll bring in one of Joe's activities. They're super cool and super fun. And the parents will persist and really love it and go, that's common core math. Oh, I didn't know. Right. So sometimes they just, they got an attitude or traumatic experience and they're locked up as a third grade. A lot of, I see that a lot. People are like, they're in third grade. You can see it. They're stuck in third grade when they right. did fractions. Right. Um, and so, so sometimes just having a positive experience doing, going to a math night and, and not be, think of it as math as death, but as math as a fun thing, yeah. a fun math night at school. Cause a lot of people are deathly, a lot of parents are deathly afraid and think about it. Math was taught very differently when they were younger. It was very fixed mindset. The, 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 and when I was in school, it was like the fastest answerers, the people who could memorize the most, the people who worked the least, they were the quote unquote best in math. Right. Right. And so that's very fixed mindset. And so if yeah. anyone, what someone might've been an amazing mathematician, a parent who now thinks they're not good at math, but now when you give them a task, like how many is a billion or, or one of Joe's, the table conferences and any of those or the tile uh, po- problems, um, they would find those really fun. I, yeah. I worked with a lot. I had an ed consultant business here and I would give that, that four fours that's on Joe Buller's site. And, and the whole family can do that. And the funny part is you could be in third grade and get more than your dad who's an engineer. So that's yeah. a really equalizing kind of math problem. Yeah, yeah, Four absolutely. fours, math activity, yeah. Okay, yeah, people can Google that as well. Yeah, so, you uh, cubed. There you go. So I wanted to just think a little bit, and this is on the note I think we're talking about anyway, but why, why do you think people struggle so much? much with math. Why is math this focal point for uh, maybe even learning disasters or, you know, the, what is it about math that makes it such a, a hot button topic? Yeah, I think it's probably the history of how it's been taught huh. and the types of people who are, were were teachers. So when I was in school, I'm like 100 years old. So this was in the 70s. Um, But, you know, the teachers had a very fixed mindset approach. Uh Like it was really, here's the book. You either get it or you don't get it. It's all about the right answers. It was very fixed mindset. And I really do think that probably did a lot of damage. Mm. You know what I mean? Um, Just kind of the right and wrong focus. That's very fixed mindset. And so if you just say you weren't able to answer really fast, you know, and you could get the answers right all the time well I guess you're bad in math and and it was and it was it seemed like it attracted even teachers who were most like that so I yeah. think it's like a long history and oh, exposure wow. and I think that's what's the beauty of the common core is I mean and we haven't necessarily got that down yet mm-hmm. but in Joe's revolution that's the beauty is that it's opening up math for everyone she has that course at Stanford where she works with undergrads who just changes their world here they are people who have been good at math their whole life they're here at Stanford mm-hmm. but they kind of hate math they're terrified of math and she she shows them all these open-ended problems low floor high ceiling multiple entry points and she does the growth mindset activities and complex instruction and at the end they love math again so right. so i do think it's as joe would say bad instruction i don't know if i want to say bad instruction but yeah. maybe she I wouldn't think that's say that okay to say, yeah. but 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 it's that type of instruction that really reinforces that some people the fast answerers are very good yeah, so it sounds like what you really laid out here is that, that we have sort of a cultural legacy that's been enduring long past after we already know better. Wow, we, you're we, so good at this. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I said. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm just listening to your words and well, parroting them funny. back for the audience. That's but, funny. Uh, this, this historical legacy of yeah. things happening along the way that we've just sort of accepted as our cultural norms for what math looks like and how it should be done and what it should look like that keep perpetuating them 
themselves in classrooms, even for people who want to make changes. They're fighting this historical tide, which uh, yeah. one of my favorite historians said, it's like being a drop of water on the tip of a huge wave. Yeah. And it's very hard to change the, the, the course of yeah. the tide. Well, then it's been working. I put that in air quotes. So it's working for somebody or we wouldn't have done it that way, right? It maybe gets mm -hmm. people into Stanford, gets them to be engineers. But I'm afraid in the 21st century and 21st century skills, maker skills and innovation and creativity, that that's not going to cut it anymore. How is the United States going to be innovative or creative if that's how they're doing math in, yeah. in K through 12? I think that, you know, Joe's approach is way more innovative. And I would think it would cultivate more creativity um, among people who, who do math that way. So that might serve our 21st century need, labor needs a little bit better, that model. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. I want to shift gears a little bit mm -hmm. here because we are running low on time oh, and no. I have so many questions oh, for no. you. So I wanted to just ask about your perspective and maybe even your philosophy around grading and how grading is done in your class or what your approach is to think about what a grade means for your students. Yeah, I know there's a big trend to, to do away with grades, but I have the constraints of being at a community college yeah. or if, even if I was in K through 12. So I didn't really have the luxury to go down that road road too far. And that's where most teachers yeah. are at. And yeah, parents yeah. have to understand that even if they want their kids to have this open experience, but, we're but stuck I, in a I, system. I just like to say that I separate learning mm -hmm. from a assessing learning. Mm. So to me, I have a growth mindset classroom. I try to encourage people to take risks. Uh, we do work in groups all the time. We deep, uh, deepen conceptual knowledge from our choice of tasks. But we can still be evaluated with time tests and still have grades. To me, that's separate. I wouldn't give them a time task, hurry up and learn this stuff. No, I wouldn't do that. But I could say, you are now going to demonstrate your mastery of this by this this assessment that we've chosen, I didn't choose it, but, you know, shared assessments. Right. So I, I, I separate those two out. So I think you can have students have a growth mindset about learning and still understand that there's an assessment and we're going to, we'll work with you on anxiety around that assessment, you know, uh, and talk about the neuroscience behind that and, and skills you can do. But, but grades at this point are an essential part of the model yeah. in the system I'm working in. And, and it, and I, I get to decide which sword I want to die on, right? Right. Right. Uh, and that's not the sort I'm going to die on here at right. the community college level or K through 12 because I'm doing so much that's really working. And I yeah. know that they're going to have grades as they go along. So I'm just going to keep going with that. That being said, I think revisions, that kind of thing can really help to, yeah. to alleviate some of the, the finality of grades and having that be, I know Joe says move away from performance oriented, but I, I can focus on that in the learning aspect. So I'm not hurrying up and saying, hurry up and learn. But I am saying, guess what? There's an assessment and you'll need to get this on it in order to achieve here. Yeah, and I, that's a, a really great point to think about because there's learning takes time and we all have our own pace to get to our learning. But if mm -hmm. a student has put in the time and gotten the supports and had the opportunities to learn, mm -hmm. they should still be able to show their learning in a way that's meaningful. And mm -hmm. I think that's kind of what you're describing. Right. Is that right? Yeah, I think that's true. And and um, you got to use some kind of assessments. I love the Mars task. And there are cooler assessments. I actually think the CASP in K through 12 in California is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. And I also say that, you know, I'm dealing with the realities and the constraints of where I'm at, you know, um, in, in a K through 14 system. Right. I, I, what's wonderful about Joe is I always told her she was a person who breathes life uh, into people's big dreams. And so she's a visionary. She's starting a revolution. And when she, you know, when enough people gain momentum and they like do away with grades, I'm on board with that. But, yeah. but given what I I can do in, in uh, K through 14 environment. I'm doing what I can do. Yeah, I mean, I it's guess not a perfect world. When, when schools like Stanford start accepting students in that don't have a GPA because no one needs that anymore, then you'll have a lot more freedom to change your practices That's in your classroom. Great right? point. Great yeah, point. Yeah. We're all, you know, <laughs> high school has almost turned into this preparation for college. For Stanford, and, yeah. yeah. Especially around here, right? Yeah. And so all these grades, everything, all the pressure we put on students, I mean, especially in Palo Alto, students jumping in front of trains because they're so stressed out. So sad. And it's, it's a horrible situation that mm -hmm. is you know, connected in some way, at least to this grading paradigm. Mm -hmm. And yet 
teachers don't have the freedom yet to do away with grades because they work in a system that expects it. So I think your perspective, I hope, I hope is really helpful to the teachers who would like to understand that grading doesn't have to be everything when it comes to teaching. It can be a part and it can be functional if you're coming at it with a, a good attitude, which I think you're giving us a good picture of. And there's a difference between learning and assessing, right? Right, right. It's different. Sometimes, you know, you do formative assessment, it informs teaching and learning, but a, a final assessment, a summative assessment is a summative assessment. Yeah. So do you have like any tricks maybe that you use specifically with grading that teachers could kind of grab a hold of as far as making sure it's clear or transparent for students, this division between learning and testing or assessment? I don't know if I really do. I okay. just, you know, we, we have assessments. They are separate, you know. I, they're yeah. just so separate. They're timed because they have to be. That's a requirement. And um, and I think I think when people, when students don't do as well as they'd like to, I bring it back to the growth. What could you do differently next time mm -hmm. to learn this? And I bring it back to skill development, that it's not a stamp on how good or bad good or bad you are at math but it's about skill development i bring everything in the class back to skill development you're not good at fractions you're not bad at fractions where are your skills right now do you know these other two skills oh it looks like on this problem what skills didn't you not know yet and so i just try to meld that line a little bit with the yeah. assessments bring it back to it so this is telling me you don't know something what are the skills you don't know yet what are the skills you haven't mastered yet you know just bring it back to skill development i guess that's the way i kind of you know try to compromise on the grade thing is just it's an indication of what sometimes okay. the indication of anxiety yeah you know we yeah. talk about grades in in that way i don't talk about like they're evil or anything but like you know what can you get from this what can you learn about what you need to improve how you can improve what strategies you could try differently later yeah 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 that's great and uh so i'm going to shift gears again mm -hmm. uh, uh you mentioned some stuff in our pre-interview talks about trying to open up and do uh create math tasks oh yes so how do you what's your process can you give us mm -hmm. just a, a little talk through of how you take a math task and make mm -hmm. it a growth minded task or how you mm -hmm. open it up for students to access it with this mm -hmm. low floor high ceiling thing right well jo i'll use joe's example okay uh she, instead of giving uh, students a bunch of papers that have 12 problems of find the area of a rectangle you say how many rectangles can you draw with an area of 144 square meters so mm. that's that's a good good example from Joe. I, I really focus on um, me personally. I'm focusing a little bit more on the, re because of my research in the Yucatan, mm -hmm. I focus a little bit more on real life problems. Oh, okay. So what I'm trying to do is give students real life problems and, and it takes a little time to come up with good ones and they're not necessarily open-ended, but enough real life problems so that they can start to think about what is the algorithm? What would you say is the algorithm? What rule could you come up with? What generalization could you make? So I, rather than me saying, these are the rules for multiplying, dividing, adding and subtracting mm -hmm. negative numbers, let's do these problems that I've made up that relate somewhat to your own life. Probably usually it's cash or food, right? Everybody loves cash or food, <laughs> but it could be other things. Um, and, um, and then we're going to try to like bring them to a place where they can model make their learning explicit like you know the eight mathematical practices uh -huh. and then from there devise their own rules so it's like they devise their own procedural knowledge in their and uh, based on their deep conceptual knowledge from doing real life problems that's yeah. kind of where I'm at right now yeah. with real life problems so it sounds like you're trying to make um, problems that seem applicable and have some maybe real use that people could grab a hold of, especially mm -hmm. in these introductory math classes mm -hmm. where we're just trying to build up skills and understanding and maybe even confidence. Mm -hmm. You're giving people a chance to see how the math you're doing in the classroom connects to things that actually matter to them. And it deepens their conceptual understanding. So I could say, here's how you, here's how you add negative numbers, right? I could say mm -hmm. that. Here's the rules. I'm the authority. Just do what I say, right? Yeah, and then yeah. we'll do some problems. Or I can give them, here's some problems that I made up and they, I, one of the tasks I have them make up a real life problem later. And you guys work in groups, try to figure it out. It's very hard. That's the beauty of learning, right? If it's hard, then you're learning. If it's just memorizing, that's a very low level task. Bloom's taxonomy, that's on the bottom, right? right. So in this way, they have a real life problem. They don't get any help from me, really. I mean, not that they don't get any help, but you know, I facilitate the discussions and ask questions. And they're required to model. So they really do make sense of the problem and they solve it in really interesting ways related to their own 
existing background knowledge. So that's mm. where it's a deeper conceptual understanding. It connects to their prior knowledge. So it goes into their long-term memory. And then we talk about how would you write your rules for adding negative numbers? How would you write your rules for subtracting negative numbers? And that just comes from them. So it's not as open-ended task as, as Joe gets to do, but is it is very linked to the standards and the content in the classroom, which is really important for me uh, in the K through 14 setting. Yeah. So it sounds like it's not just application for the sake of making it applicable, but it's also application for the sake of a very strategic thing where you're trying to make it stick and mm -hmm. something that is relatable in their mind to things they already understand. Schema, yeah. if you will, yes, relating exactly. to the schema of what is prior understandings the and students have. Exactly. I, I bring a lot of Ed Psych into the class because uh, at San Jose State, I got to teach Ed Psych, so it really helped me to really <laughs> firm up my understanding of how those those old, kind of old, well-established psych theories are instantiated in instruction. Yeah, yeah, and that's so important, and it's bridging that gap between the different disciplines and bringing right. them. That is what needs to happen in a classroom, because a classroom is not just math or just psychology or just mindset. It mm -hmm. is everything together with many, many different students' view of what that means. So you have to be this dynamic, ever-adapting mm -hmm. person to make that happen for students. Yeah, I really like the analogy of the weaver when I work with the teachers I say you guys are weavers you're taking all these strands of experience and professional knowledge and you're weaving them into this tapestry of instruction and it's very complex and it happens real time and so they're really teachers are really improvisational artists right and it's a lot of work it's both cognitively and emotionally demanding oh absolutely and the more pools of knowledge you have to draw from like ed psych theory stereotype thread growth mindset math uh, pedagogy I mean the the more complex the job is Absolutely. And it is such a complex job. And we appreciate, I appreciate that you're doing it and that the world has you as oh, part of this. That's very sweet. If there, I, I do have to let you get going here pretty soon. We're just about out of time. So I just wanted to give you a chance. If you have any final words of encouragement for the audience or anything you'd like to leave them to think about or look up more of, you could throw that out before I say goodbye. And I think that would be great. Yeah, I'm not really sure. I think okay. I think watching Joe Bowler videos, looking at Joe Bowler tasks, looking at Dweck videos is really good. But I really caution people about this idea of simplifying growth mindset so that it ends up kind of blaming the students. Research mm -hmm. is clear on that yeah. discord that, that blames students even like, well, you need a fixed mind. You need a growth mindset or you need to have grit is, is quite dangerous and, and yeah. it takes the burden off the teacher to, to change the perform uh, the you know the the learning goals of the students oh that's great and we're gonna have to end with that so okay. thank you so much well, dr felicia you. darling here in the studio at kzsu this is modern education